on. It really does help uh, to make this a much better show. This is your show. And so your participation is so very valuable. Okay, we've joined our live stream. So uh, let's get this show on the road. Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. And today we're chatting about the conservation of aquatic species and the importance of aquarios with special guests, Bob Davidson, CEO of the Seattle Aquarium, Peter Kariva, uh, President and CEO of the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California, and Cynthia Whitbread Spanulis, President and CEO of the Virginia Aquarium. And a reminder to Zoom attendees that we'll take three snap polls during the show and we'll announce results. And your questions submitted through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen will be included in our discussion. So thank you all from joining, uh, for joining us uh, scattered all across the United States, but with one topic in common, the, the idea of a marine environment that is clean, that is healthy, and, that, uh, is, and to which we are connected. So let's sort of set this up and we're gonna go uh, to you, Bob, uh, in Seattle first. 71% uh, of our planet is covered by water and there's huge unseen diversity of life beneath that water. So let's talk about your uh, mission in connecting us to that environment and educating us and how we can be good stewards of 71% of the planet. Thanks, thanks very much and appreciate uh, your inviting us to, uh, to join this conversation. Uh, the mission of the Seattle Aquarium is inspiring conservation of our marine environment and that is, uh, drives uh, everything that we do. Um, as you say, the, the urgency of that, that mission and the state of the oceans, uh, the role of, of the ocean in, in sustaining life on the planet is becoming better appreciated, but, but because the, uh, it's really only recently that uh, humans have, have been able to penetrate uh, going underwater uh, effectively to really understand what's, what's going on and what the effect is that humans are having on the ocean. We can basically go anywhere. We can actually see it with our own eyes. We can actually count species and see the diminution and the effect. We can actually analyze um, the effects of plastic and, po and pollution. And, and we, can, we can see that the coral reefs are shrinking. Why is that important? When, when you look at that, you know, beyond the fact that weed fish and, and aquatic species are, are uh, so important to the food chain, why is biodiversity, Peter, uh, important to the ultimate sustainability of our environment so that we have a place to live? Sure, first I want to add a little side note to what Bob said. Uh, yeah, we can see all those places, but we've done a better job mapping Mars than we've mapped the bottom of the ocean. So we still got a lot to do. <laughs> but to your to your point, I, I, you know, uh, species are, are are like the parts of your of your automobile. That they're the they're the elements that make the ecosystem run. We don't have full understanding, so we we essentially, you know, species are about carbon, um, they're about nutrients, they're about water, floods, and everything. So we, we protect species to protect the planet, not just the species themselves, although the species themselves we certainly have empathy for. So I've seen a statistic that about 30% uh, of the species in uh, the land species in North America are likely to die off in the next 40 years. Is, is that also um, a, a, a real concern in the oceans, uh, Cynthia? Absolutely. So we know that 90% of the world's big fish are actually gone from the planet at this point. And so that's a huge concern for us in terms of our sustainable future for seafood, um, as well as, as Peter mentioned, just the biodiversity of our world. Um, the world depends on these oceans. And as we continue to look to the future, we've got to make some serious changes um, if we expect um, the oceans to survive as well as the world to survive. 90%, you said that just sort of the very widely, 90%. Could you just go into that a little bit more? Sure, um, so we have a great um, sustainable seafood program. 
Um, and if you check out our website um, at the uh, virginiaaquarium.com, it goes into more detail about this. Um, but of course we've overfished for years. We haven't been very sustainable um, with our seafood practices. And so of course our goal here, as well as I know at Peter and Bob's um, locations, as well as aquariums throughout the world is to share with people on how they can actually have sustainable seafood um, practices when they buy their seafood. Um, we fish the really big fish out um, because that's the, the choice fish, um, but those are the fish that actually reproduce. And so we're really hurting ourselves in the long run. And so we've got to make changes, or as Peter said, we're, we're just not gonna have, um, we're just not gonna have those um, choices in the future and our whole world actually um, will be impacted. Oh, it, it, it's what you're all saying is that we have a we have a uh, an issue that really has to permeate uh, these different sections of of our consciousness. So we have um, our our whole um, nourishment chain, right? Our food chain, and there's a whole industry that that is served. Uh, you know, Bob, the the, the fishing industry uh, in and around Seattle, very very large industry. You're, um, Bob, uh, and, and you, Peter, are some of the largest ports in the world, right? You have the whole issue of, of ocean going and, and trade and the, the you know, production of, uh, of materials. Bob, um, how do you, in your mission, try and cross boundaries and try and engage people from all walks of life with all sorts of concerns, all sorts of economic interests in, in this idea of your mission? So that, so that you are not only just a facility that kids come to to see fish, but you're also doing other things and, and impacting um, the Seattle environment. Well, one of the things that we found is that um, it, it is a very complex uh, uh, picture uh, on all these elements of the economy and of, and of the uh, ecosystems of, of the ocean and the estuaries. And, and for, for many centuries, uh, the patterns of uh, people's um, uh, exploitation, if you will, or use of the resources, the natural resources of the planet, and in, in our case, the, the, um, uh, the oceans, um, has <clears throat> millions of people who depend upon a certain way of doing things. And so, it's it's not very productive for us to just march in and and shame them um, into changing because them is us the, i mean the, them, is, them is me them yeah. is you right yeah, i mean look at your dinner table um uh, and uh, uh, all of us and and so i, I think the and, and frankly science only goes so far and i think i mean look around the country uh, at the at the sit at these big disputes that we've had over uh, very important issues, including this particular one, and the the um, uh, so in in w what we have found is that that the unique um, asset, if you will, or characteristic of our aquariums is that it puts uh, human beings. Uh, directly into contact with live species uh, in the oceans in a in a different way and in a way which which uh, if we if we do our job right establishes elements and threads of empathy um, beyond science and and so we have tried very consciously uh, in our work our the the training that we give to our volunteers and our staff as they deal with the public to to make these things real and and uh, and personal in terms of, of the physical plant that you have Peter um, and and then Cynthia if you could also uh, weigh in um, one of the things that strikes me as I go around the country and I look at, at different aquaria and I was saying something about this before the show uh, commenced is that the physical infrastructure of a lot of these, these organizations were planned uh, sometimes as far back as the 50s and 60s. Um, 
the, a lot of that infrastructure is aging and the facilities are not necessarily as conducive to that mission that, that, uh, that Bob um, uh, described as they might be. Uh, in terms of, of how you are developing your facility and your programs, Peter, how do you work around that fact? And, and what kind of investments do you need in order to better pursue this, this mission that, that Bob described? Yeah, I mean, we just completed this huge new project called Pacific Visions, and it's a large immersive theater, sort of like IMAX. And we find that's a place where uh, people really get excited. It's 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 not immediate animal experience, but it sets them up for the animal experience. And one of the things that's speaking to what Bob said, you know, we're a fragmented country. You know, there's the elites and non-elites, college educated, not, you know, goes, you know, Soccer, those go to soccer games and football games. Those who read New Yorker, watch Fox News. Look at any audience at an aquarium and they're all there. They're all there. So we really emphasize being a place for conversation. And we, when we have uh, lectures and education afterwards, we have receptions with an open bar and people talk. It's not, a, it's not talking at people, it's conversation. And I think because of who we bring into our doors, there's no other institution. Universities can't do it. Right. right. Only aquarium zoos can do it. And we just had a we just had a show a couple of weeks ago with um, some representatives of the aquaculture industry. So people who raise fish uh, and protein uh, um, for for a living. We had the head of the Maine Aquaculture uh, Association, the National Aquaculture. Everybody is bound together with these interests, right, Cynthia? I mean, we we all care. But now, how do we go from caring? to doing something about it. I mean, is it something that is as simple as, as what I buy today, how I, you know, what car I drive, or is, is there more that we can do um, to, to help aquatic species that, that might need help? Um, for example, during the summer, during spawning season. Sure, um, you know, I always, I always tell our educators, if you, we have a huge, we have huge buildings here. And if you told me I had to paint the building with a paintbrush that was this small, I'd tell you that I give up and um, yeah, I'm gonna go. And so that's how I equate it when we tell people they've actually have to make changes. They think, oh, it doesn't, it doesn't matter that I, that I make that change because I'm just one small person. But collectively those changes together actually do make a difference. Um, so I would encourage people to become more educated on some of the things that they actually do or don't do um, in their personal lives. Um, that's what we, we hope when people visit our aquarium um, and they, they love it, they get to appreciate the, the life they see here, but we're also showing them what it means for a plastic bag, how a plastic bag as simple as that in the ocean get looks just like a jellyfish and uh, sea turtles um, consume them. And then, you know, we spend um, about 365 uh, days a year, we're out um, doing our conservation work on rehabbing and um, trying to re-release those endangered species back into the environment. But that one plastic bag that you use was what they consumed. And so, again, we want them to love the environment. We want them to enjoy and love marine life. But at the same time, we collectively need to make changes in our lives um, just so that we can continue um, with some of So the you're saying if, you, if you're going to, if you're going shopping, bring your own bag. If you don't have your own bag, get a paper one. Don't get a plastic one. Absolutely. Right? And, and regardless, when we go and we buy something, one of the things we could do is, you know, if we're buying uh, seafood, for example, we can look at our little, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and see whether, whether that particular species is sustainable, sustainably harbor, harvested. We can go to and shop in places that really legitimately are, are trying for sustainability. It's those kinds of little things. And then we can also help you on some of your programs. Could you talk a little bit about some of the programs that you have? Um, uh, because we just we just took a poll. We talked about visitation to aquaria, and we found that about sixty percent have visited uh, aquaria in, in the last um, year. But it's not just being physically in the aquarium, right? I mean, you you were talking about uh, some of your programs outside of the aquarium. Talk about that. Sure. So um, I think you're the easiest thing, and Monterey has probably the best uh, Monterey aquarium 
They have the best um, sustainable seafood app that it's free. You can download it. So when you do go into a restaurant, your grocery store, um, we, we produce our own guide as well that's based on Monterey's, but it helps you pick the seafood that you're going to eat. Um, so that's the easiest program. That and particularly can- with the history of the collapse of the entire fishery down there, right? I mean, they, they basically overfished until there was nothing there. The year before they collapsed, they had their biggest harvest. There you go. Yeah, so they have, I mean, so there's a lot of opportunities. We do a lot of outreach um, through our websites. Um, We do a lot of um, live stream programs. Um, So there's a lot of opportunities for people to learn more. Um, They just need to reach out and they don't actually have to visit. They can see it through our website, through our Facebook page. Um, So there's a lot of opportunities for people to get involved. Peter, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Bob, you would also, I'm sorry, uh, I, I just wanted to prompt you, but, th- but then talk about what you were going to talk about. You would, you would mention the involvement of the uh, Seattle Aquarium in the whole ecosystem around development. So, um, and that also, right, how we develop, what we develop, how we connect into marine environments, how we retain that connection is so important. Could you just talk a little bit about that? And I'm sorry, I didn't mean to step on your, your previous. No, point. no, no, thank you. The, yes, we're, uh, for the last, over the last decade, we've been involved in, in the uh, conversations um, in our region uh, on, on the redevelopment of the city's relationship to Puget Sound and, and out to the ocean. And um, it's, it's allowed us to think, think uh, in different ways. Uh, for example, uh, we, were, we, we realized that we were dumping all, uh, uh, millions of gallons of, of uh, uh, rainwater uh, that had gone through the streets and picked up all kinds of bad things, uh, da- damaging to the life of the, of the fish, mm-hmm. and just dumped them right into the, into the sound. And so as, as we removed an elevated highway and, and built a, a tunnel under the city to move that traffic, uh, we also, as a, as a community, invested uh, in programs to change that. And, and so that's a plus. We're, we're also, as part of that, and to your earlier point about these, uh, uh, keeping these facilities up to date, um, we're uh, the the Seattle Aquarium opened in 1977, um, and we've we've had some some modernization since then. Um, uh, and as as part of the redevelopment of, of our waterfront, we're we're investing 160 million dollars in uh, new facilities focused on the connection between um, North America and the west coast of of North America with the ocean, the Coral Triangle, mm-hmm. uh, just off Indonesia. And, and recognizing we've sent our teams uh, over there and work, we're working with uh, local scientists and local community groups. And, and what we find is that the pictures that you see of plastics on the beach and, and uh, ocean trash are the same pictures that you see on our beaches. There are plastics. There are plastics, and they're everywhere. And and I think so. To some of the points made earlier, this a role of aquariums, and and certainly in the building, in our new building, and the exhibits that we're building, we are working to to um, help people to connect the dots, to understand. I mean, our our focus for the first fifty years of the aquarium's existence was was all in, in local Washington waters. And as we were thinking about what do we do with the expansion, we realized the world has changed. Our understanding of how we all connect to each other has changed and what a golden moment to, to uh, shift the, the experience that they get when they come to the Seattle Aquarium. Peter, uh, uh, Bob mentioned the whole issue of runoff. He mentioned the fact that that uh, plastics that might uh, float into the ocean end up in Indonesia. Uh, could you talk a little bit from, from your uh, position at the Aquarium of the Pacific um, at being right at, at 
the juncture of another major, major metropolitan area, how you see those interconnections and what you can do and what we can do to, to shift. Because if we're the ones who are polluting in the industrial world and the non-industrial world is, is um, are experiencing the downstream effects, it seems to, uh, to me that we have a special obligation we're not necessarily fulfilling. Yeah, so I would say, it, you know, we do it at two levels. One is uh, you only care about what you know. And so part of it is just letting people know about what's going on. Uh, and that's true with the, even just with our animals. People are changed by encounters with the animals. So you, you make them a little bit less self-absorbed. And then more specifically and intellectually, we sit at the mouth of the L.A. River. Uh, we're having a, uh, a lecture tomorrow night from the Ocean Sewage Alliance that was just formed because 80% of human sewage is released untreated globally. 80%, 80%, 80%. globally. Yeah, and so that's that means just primary treated, which just gets the big objects out of it. That ends up in the ocean. It's a huge thing. Nobody is aware of it. Um, and, and so we, we try to, to make people aware of these things so they know about them, but not do it in a preachy way. Do it in, in a way that's compelling and engaging. So that's really interesting. We just finished a, a uh, poll. So your point is very timely. We said, you know, how do you mostly learn about aquatic conservation? And 33% and, uh, uh, people said by visiting Aquaria. But the rest said all sorts of different ways, subscribing to conservation channels, social media, uh, work or school, with uh, also almost 30% saying other mechanisms. And what yeah. you're saying, Peter, is that it's not just okay to, to build a facility and say, come on in, we'll charge admission or provide um, certain uh, waivers of admission. You actually have to go out and, and reach out and provide a much more textured experience. So as we let's go around the room and let's talk about the, the non-traditional non aquaria type of experiences that you're affording your audiences. Peter, um, you talked about a lecture. Could you give us another example of, of how you um, you expose people to your work? Sure, TikTok. So we have 2.5 million followers on TikTok. Biggest oh. of any public institution in the world, you know, at Aquarium or Zoo, 2.5 million followers. Oh. And if you look at those videos, people love them. And you do two things. It inspires people, it entertains people, but you also learn what they care about. You can see, you learn a lot about your audience by their responses to them. How'd you get that done? Well, we have amazing staff. So a couple of young women who uh, are of the right generation, which isn't ours, <laughs> but uh, during COVID, you, you know, we were kind of shut down and they figured it out. So, so we didn't have TikTok much before COVID. <laughs> <laughs> that's really that, that's really cool. What a great example. Yeah, and I should give a shout out to the word. Madeline Barber is the woman who really did it from scratch. Well, that's really important because we are all powerful. You know, we can be creative. We can all take our individual actions. And I'm going to bet that nobody came to you and asked you for permission. Right. They, oh, yeah. Nobody asked me for permission for anything. But yeah. <laughs> so, right. Right. So, I, I mean, that's the thing, the creativity that, are, that is embedded in this, in, in, in the people who support uh, these causes is just wonderful. I, and, and that sort of drives the dialogue forward. Cynthia, you have other examples, I know. Sure. Um, well, I would say that our research and conservation arm that is um, doing research throughout the world, you mentioned the port. We have the world's largest East Coast port here um, off of uh, Virginia Beach's coast. Um, so the, our research and conservation arm is out there doing a lot of research on boat speeds and um, we offshore winds. And so we're involving ourselves in a lot of conversations through our research and conservation piece in terms of research on impacts to the environment. And it could be good impacts to the environment, um, but being able to share that research um, with different industries and institutions is how we're reaching and making a difference um, here at the Virginia Aquarium. Well, you know, you make a very good point. In traditionalist um, practice, um, there, there has been this sense that conservation and uh, other interests must be at loggerheads. But I think we've gotten to the point where the world is so small that if we don't have conservation, we won't have a um, aquatic foods industry. If we don't have 
conservation, our, our um, shorelines will uh, disintegrate and our cities will be impacted by, um, by these massive storms. The, the connection and the, the mutual interests are so important. Uh, Bob, what kind of programs do you have that are not, that you wouldn't consider to be kind of a traditional aquarium kind of program that, that might have been done in the 1960s, but today is just having uh, great traction over in Seattle? Well, one of the things that, that we realized is that the, in, in assessing the audience who comes to the, the aquarium, that uh, we, have a, we have a large number of people who come from someplace other than Seattle, Mm -hmm. And and that's that's a, a big audience, but the people who live in this region, uh, we 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 found that there were uh, uh, a number of communities that, even though I mean in theory you think well you know it's very easy to drive to the aquarium, uh, but uh, they're not driving. They weren't driving. They weren't maybe they didn't have a car. Uh, uh, often uh, these are communities of color, and and uh, where uh, things that that appear easy are are not. Uh, so you don't want the you don't want the aquarium to be a institution for people with means. You don't want to be uh, want the aquarium to be a white aquarium. You don't want the aquarium to be an aquarium for people with cars. Is that's what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. And so we we set up. Uh, we developed relationships with over 400 uh, organizations uh, in the metropolitan area uh, to work with us as partners in, in uh, sharing uh, free tickets uh, and information, access, uh, uh, sometimes transportation on, on how, how, they, how, how they could take advantage of this, that there should be no barrier for anyone who wants to come. Uh, and and we have, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, some of these community partners were pretty devastated in this in this whole pandemic period. But they're they're coming back, and and so through them, they we we uh, uh, distribute uh, over sixty thousand free admissions a year uh, to people who might not otherwise think about coming or or be able to come. So I love the thinking here because what you're basically saying is that is that part of your expertise is to analyze the audience that you have versus the audience that you want. Exactly. And today's focus on sustainability with the COP26 conference going on and, and all this attention that we must pay to our environment. Um, how do you shape an audience? You're asking the question, how do you shape the audience that you want versus the audience that you have? So you have a lot of skills, a lot of professional skills, data analytics, right? Audience segmentation, TikTok, right? You have all these different ways because you got to approach people where they are. So uh, we're going to, uh, we're coming to the end of our time. So we're going to go, um, uh, uh, Bob, um, uh, we're going to come back to you, uh, uh, Peter. Um uh, if, if I were going to um, select um, something that I need to do, um, I already know what that is. In my life, I am trying to not buy anything that is plastic. Anything, right? So if I'm going to get a spatula, I'm not going to get a plastic spatula. I'm going to get a spatula that is made out of, out of some renewable material, right? I'm trying not to buy any plastic bags. I'm just not trying to do any of that. It's, it's interesting. It's a challenging idea. Um, what else should we all be doing today? So well, a small thing. It's a multiplier. I'm going to give a bizarre answer. Mentoring. I mean, you could do one thing, but you can multiply that fact if you mentor 10 young people. And you mentor them in a way that they become leaders. So we invest a lot in creating leaders. We have an American Indian fellowship, an African American fellowship, a Hispanic fellowship. So mentoring is a mentoring is multiplying. So also sharing experiences, sharing right. perspectives. I think that's 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 fantastic. What a what a great answer, Cynthia. You have to top that now. You know. <laughs> I don't know if I can top that. I think it's just inspiring people to love the marine environment. I think that that's our ultimate mission 
and goal here. And thank you, Mark, for trying to reduce your own consumption. And I would just encourage others to follow suit and just examine what you're doing in your life that you can actually make changes to and know that you're making a positive impact and be, and be um, excited about that change and um, know that, that that's going to change the world. I so love your answer because your answer is make it fun, right? Make Absolutely. it inspiring, make it fun. So Bob, you've got, you've got mentoring <laughs> and fun. I, I, I don't know what you're going to say because <laughs> You know, I think I think you've already been top, but give it a shot. Well, so so I, I would say uh, yes, yes, yes to th those those great uh, uh, notions and activities, and and what 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 we are doing. What, one of the most powerful things that we do is through the energy of uh, volunteers, and we have over a thousand volunteers uh, who are are regular trained. Uh, 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 workers for us in both on site and on the beaches and in the community, and and among that group is a group that that we call the Youth Ocean Advocates, and these are high school students who come together and they are we get, uh, uh, I don't mean to say that we ignore them but we give them very little direction. Um, accept the challenge that you're that we're talking about is what what can you do um, to toward our mission that um, uh, it, that often involves fun uh, and it involves urgency uh, and it's it's uh, uh, it's something that that they they design themselves and so uh, I, I think you you equal you you have mentoring you've got it uh, fun and inspiration, and then you have empowered involvement, right? It's basically listening to the sensibilities of, of people of different ages coming from different places and giving them power. Um, in fact, not even giving, they take power and, 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 uh, and you benefit from it, from all those volunteers. Bob Davidson, CEO of the Seattle Aquarium, Pete Kariva, President and CEO of the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California, and Cynthia Whitbread Spinulas, President and CEO of the Virginia Aquarium, thank you so much for sharing the expertise of your, uh, of you, you, your staffs, your board, your communities, your volunteers, and thank you so much for your work. It's it's great to have you on. Very inspiring. Thank Thanks. you. And